Okay, this is uh, Dr. Morton, DSD, for Monday, the 12th of October. So the original schedule showed uh, a test for this date. Uh, I've revised that schedule. The test will be on Friday. I, I mentioned that, I think, in the last uh, lecture, and I mentioned it in the, in the, help, in the Zoom help session. Um, you, some, some of you are, no doubt, still working on... Um, still working on your uh, uh, your practicum and that's fine uh, so just so everybody knows I did put uh, a good outline uh, for the practicum or, or sorry I, I put I put code I put the constraint constraint file uh, and I put a video of my board actually executing it like it's supposed to be done so uh, you can you can certainly uh, look at my code and you should get some pretty good ideas about how to fix your code um, I would like you to not cut and paste my code in. <laughs> uh, I'd like you to try and write your own code. Um, so, uh, so I'd like you to make a real effort on that. And hopefully you've started on it, you've been working, and you've kind of run into some frustration. And so hopefully you can see now some of those issues. Uh, you can definitely come to lab on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and get help. I'll be there. I'll be there probably for the first hour of lab on all three of those. Well, on Wednesday, maybe only the first, uh, on Monday, I have a, a 2.30 that I meet with some independent study students, but I'll come back down later on and, and help you some more. So uh, so make sure make sure you're, you know, come in and get help in lab if you need it uh, for your practicum. Also, there's a lab to be done next week too. Um, so next week will be a busy week. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, re reviewing for the uh, for the test one. Uh, let's look at the syllabus here real quick. Um, and I will factor myself down here. Okay, so you can see. Um, so here we're going to be on the twelfth. Uh, by the way, midterm grades are due. I'll, I'll probably give everybody. Um, I may just assign everybody a B, unless uh, unless you're really in trouble, in which case um, I may give you a C. So if you see a C, you know that you need to kind of pick up the pace a little bit. Probably, you know, I, I probably mostly give A's and B's for the course. Um, but uh, so if you see a C, it means you, you you may be lagging a little bit, that you're not keeping up with lectures, you're not, uh, and you didn't do that well on the uh, on the uh, logic design review test. Um, and that sort of thing and homework so we'll see okay um, so that's uh, so so that's uh, yeah so that's the midterm grades and then uh, Wednesday I'll do a review I probably won't even start chapter 7 I'll just review for the test and then Friday we'll have test 1 theory over chapters 2 through 4 there won't be any code uh, it'll just be uh, multiple choice type questions so uh, our true false or fill in the blank or numeric but it's going to be a online test just kind of like your quizzes uh, the lecture quizzes all right then as we move along uh, we will do another uh, uh, test two on the 13th of November so in about a month uh, we'll do a second test and uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the final project uh, starting off November and I'll probably give you several choices, and that'll be pretty much what you have to do to finish it up. And then uh, we'll have these uh, these later classes, uh, 11, A, B, C, D. Those are just uh, those are just um, uh, additional topics. Not really. They won't. They aren't in the book. Uh, but we'll just talk about some extra things. Uh, we may or may not do all those all those topics. We'll see. And then. I'll probably do the final exam. Uh, I'll, what I'll probably do is just make it available, uh, maybe the last week of school, and let you all finish it uh, early. We'll see. That, that's kind of my plan. All right. Well, anyway, so that's where we are with that. All right. So let me uh, let me shrink this down just a little bit more, and then we will. Um, And we'll move this up just a little bit. Okay, something like that. All right. So we're going to talk about the cost of programmability. Um, 
a, a big part of the hardware in an FPGA is there to allow it to be programmed. So that is that is a downside of FPGAs. They they have a lot of additional hardware that re, that is there simply to allow you to, to do the programming. Um, obviously, if they're going to be programmable, you have to have that. Uh, if you had a dedicated integrated circuit, you wouldn't need any of that. But the dedicated integrated circuit requires uh, all of the work in a foundry for your particular chip. So if you only need a few of these, uh, an FPGA is a huge advantage. Uh, but it does carry with it this, uh, the, you know, a, a significant additional amount of hardware just to make it programmable. And uh, that increases the heat, uh, the size, uh, and also the complexity, because as you know, at least in the Xilinx chips, uh, they don't use they don't use Flash or EEPROM for programming it. They uh, they they use uh, RAM, static RAM, and so what that means is then when you power down your FPGA, the program is always lost on a Xilinx part. So uh, what you have to do then is you have to have additional circuitry to power to program the chip on power up uh, and they do uh, they do bend over backwards to make a lot of ways for you to do this um, but still that means extra hardware so th th there is a little bit downside there are some there, there are a number of FPGA manufacturers who don't take this approach who actually do use uh, EEPROM or, or flash uh, to put the program into uh, non-volatile read-only memory so that once you program it, it's there, and you don't have to uh, uh, program it at power up uh, every time you power up the chip. So, but uh, Xilinx parts have some advantages. They're 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 uh, they have greater capability and and a number of features that still make them uh, the market leader. So, um, so for those reasons, uh, they're. The, the path they've chosen seems to be working out. I guess that's what I'm saying. But you, you do have to remember that there, 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 are some, there, there are some issues, and the cost of programmability is certainly a big one. Uh, we've talked about one hot state assignment when we did flip-flop state assignment in logic design. We mentioned that you can have uh, a flip-flop for every state, and you set it up so that only one flip-flop is ever on at any given time, and, and we call that the one hot state assignment. In FPGAs, this is the ideal place to use this technique. And it gives you some advantages because uh, everything else is zero. There's only a single one in, uh, in your state vector. And uh, that does, that can simplify some of your logic. And why, do we, why would we consider doing that with an FPGA? Well, because the FPGAs often have a lot of flip-flops available anyway, and you might as well use them. Um, we'll talk about how to, how to measure and assess the capacity of an FPGA. This is a real bugaboo. Uh, it's a problem because um, because you you know if you're um, let's say you're a team leader and you're going to do a design and you you're pretty well decided that that a good way to do this is going to be to use an FPGA. How do you how do you pick the FPGA that's going to work for your design? Well, you want one that's big enough to hold everything. Um, and, and yet you don't want one with a tremendous amount of additional capacity because then that's going to cost, that's going to raise the cost of the FPGA and it, wouldn't, it won't help you because you, you won't use that additional capacity. Um, so you do want to size it somewhat appropriately for the problem you have. And at this point you may not even have the problem all that scoped out. So it's really a challenge to compare FPGAs and, and then it, it's bad enough to compare, say, Xilinx parts against Xilinx parts, but it's entirely different to, to compare a Xilinx part against a, you know, against an Actel part, against a, a number of other manufacturers. And so because of that, uh, there have been some attempts to try and, uh, try and develop ways of measuring capacity, and we'll talk about that a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about the process of how we translate a design from your uh, very log code to uh, the bitmap that gets uh, actually uh, put in the machine, which includes synthesis, mapping, placement, and routing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the cost of programmability. So again, you know in our chip, we, we, this, these slides are a little bit dated because they, they go back to uh, uh, 
a previous generation where we had uh, primarily LUT fours, and uh, but we have LUT sixes, so we're we have some advantages over this. But in any event, so how how do these things? How is the programming set up? Well, for a LUT four, you'd have to have 16 static RAM cells to program this LUT four. Now for our LUT six, you you actually have to have 64 static RAM cells to program it. You have to store the desired value for f for all possible values for all, in this case, all four inputs. So you have 16 rows. But in the case of six, you have 64 rows. And so you have to have a, a RAM cell to store the desired f for every one of those rows. Um, for all these two to one muxes, you need another RAM cell for the control line so that you selected whichever line it's going to be here. And both of these two have a take a bit. Uh, if you have a lot three, it takes eight. Uh, if you have this, these each take a single bit. Uh, so you can see, just for this one slice, uh, you would have 16 plus 16 plus 8 plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 additional uh, bits. And there's also uh, the carry chain and the and or or chain that, that's not uh, figured into this. So, so there's really quite a bit of additional hardware that goes in. Uh, to to do this and remember each one of these RAM cells what takes four or five transistors so this is quite a big you know it's, it's a big deal um, <clears throat> okay so here's some of the uh, here's some of the parts uh, we don't have the we don't have the Artrix on here and the one that this vertex is this vertex family is the one that has these LUT fours. Um, so you can see how many how many configuration bits are involved uh, for some of these parts. Uh, Eighty megabytes of configuration bits. Uh, I think for our part, I don't remember, but uh, quite a bit. Um, so, how do we measure this capacity? So, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it's not a straightforward question uh, because different FPGAs use different technologies. Some, some do use, uh, they have a sea of gates that you can hook up, but others use lookup tables and multiplexers. So how do you compare these? And uh, so one of the things that they came up with is this metric called an equivalent gate count. And, and so this, this, sometimes they do, okay, how big of an atypical, uh, an, how big of an application specific integrated circuit design can fit into your FPGA? And so that, that can be one measure, okay? That's also kind of tricky. Um, so, um, so, the, so the approximate equivalent gate count, uh, <clears throat> you kind of figure the number of circuits one logic block can implement, and then you multiply by the number of logic blocks. So that can give you sort of an equivalent gate count. Uh, but a better way to do this, there's, a, there's a, a, an organization called PREP, and let's see, I think I have it. Yeah, Programmable Electronic Performance. So this, this is a nonprofit organization, and uh, it was created by a consortium of the FPGA manufacturers. And what they try and do is have a, a series of benchmarks for programmable logic, which makes sense. Um, so, it, so if the benchmark circuit requires 2,000 gates in an application-specific integrated circuit, you see how many can fit into your FPGA, and then you multiply it by 2,000. So if you fit 20 copies, then that gives you a 40K gate count. Okay, So that's one way to do it. And the PREP has um, a whole bunch of benchmarks that uh, can give a little bit of a measure to allow FPGAs to be compared. Um, and here's the here's the prep uh, suite, and I'm sure it's been updated. This is probably a little bit old, but uh, but there's uh, there's so this 8-bit data path, and it's made up like this. There's a timer counter. Uh, there's a state machine. There's an ALU. There's an accumulator, and then there's counters with synchronous load and enable, prescaler, uh, load and enable, and address decoders, all 16 bits. So so these are some of the, the prep benchmarks that exist. And so you can, you can see, uh, you can talk about how many of these you can implement 
uh, with a particular FPGA and compare it to another and see compare their scores on these on these in this suite of benchmarks. Now, uh, this this is a uh, Well, I, I, I don't know how well it's worked. I think it's been it's been a step in the right direction, but it's still very difficult. Uh, and obviously, the the members of this consortium have definitely uh, tried to wicker things so that uh, you know as much as they could to try and have some of these benchmarks be favorable to their particular topology. Uh, so even then, you're you're not a hundred percent certain how great a comparison this really is. Um, all right, let's talk a, talk a little bit about design translation. So one of the things I'd like you to do is 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 in your mind sort of have a little bit of a uh, be able to kind of spit out what the steps are in this in this synthesis operation. Now you know from running your code in Vivado that Vivado walks you through a number of these steps, um, and so it's really good to just pay attention to that and, and make sure you do know uh, just what that looks like. Uh, so for instance, you should know uh, s that you have a, the synthesis process involves translation, an optimization step, and a mapping step. And then then there's a, uh, then once you get this, uh, this set of primitives all set to go, then you have to decide, then the synthesizer has to decide how to place them and how to connect them. So and once you get this place and routed, uh, let's see if I, yeah, okay. So, so basically, most of the time that your synthesis tools ha has a library of primitives that it calls on. And um, some of these primitives may be more complicated than others. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that happens, for instance, when you multiply two integers, uh, the synthesizer will will probably go out and try and use one of the one of the uh, uh, eighteen bit by eighteen bit multipliers to make this happen. Um, so so there so if you um, there may be some standard uh, some standard adders that the synthesizer is going to use as opposed to doing say a ripple carry adder which might slow things down. It, it might very well. Uh, do a carry look ahead adder, for instance, and uh, so one of the so so going through the steps. So the first step is to convert the design statement statement by statement, and here are some of the conversions that happen. All your registers get converted to registers. Uh, your case statements turn into multiplexers. Your uh, anytime you have a plus or a minus, then you then you have to have an adder. Uh, Anytime you're shifting things, then you have a shift register. And you can see, so basically whenever you do one of these, uh, some function, it goes into the library to try and pull out that piece. Now, is your shift register going to be a ripple shift register, or is it going to be a barrel shifter so it can shift multiple shifts in one, in, in one step, as opposed to having to uh, ripple the shift. If it, say, ripples shifts left five, is it going to have to take it in five chunks, or is it going to be able to jump, do it in one, uh, in one step by using a barrel shifter, which, of course, involves a lot more gates. And, and then, uh, then you have an optimization step where your synthesizer is going to try and really reduce the logic. Um, and the synthesizers are pretty powerful optimizers. Um, and so this is, a, this, this is important. Sometimes it'll optimize your code in ways you didn't think uh, you wanted it to do it uh, because you didn't write very good code. So that can be a, a problem. So here's here's sort of a synthesis example, okay? So we have this case example. We have uh, two ports. A is an input, B is an output. They're both two bits. And then you, you define B as a register, and then we have an always block with a case statement. And we have, oops, and we have four cases. Uh, if uh, it's, so the, the switch is A. So if A is zero, then we set B equal to one. If A is one, we set b equal to 3. If a is 2, we set b equal to 0. And if a is 3, we set b equal to 1. The same as 0. Okay, so uh, immediately you can begin to imagine that uh, you could optimize this because case 0 and case 3 have the same thing. 
So, uh, so here would be a multiplexer. Uh, so you have uh, two bits, right? Two bits of A and two bits of B. And so this outputs, the A is the input. So you have A1 and A0 here, and A1 and A0 here. And then here are your two bits of B. One, bit one, the higher order bits here, and the lower order bits there. So back to here, in case one, B should be one. In case, or so case zero, B should be one, but case one, B should be three. So if we look at case one, we get a one for the higher order and we get a one for the lower order. So that gives us a one, one for B. Whereas for A, we just get a zero for the higher order and a one for the lower order. So that gives us a zero, one. And then uh, case uh, two, B is zero. So that's just zero, zero. And then finally back to one. So here you have zeros for both the higher and the lower order bits, and here you have zero, 01 again. So 0, 01, 1, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 01. Those are the choices. And we do that with two multiplexers. Okay, now what about uh, what about a little more optimization? Well, so if you do a if you do a uh, uh, if you do a little truth table here, uh, you can see for a 0, 0 you want this. You want this for a zero one, for one zero you want that, and for one one you want this. So you do then you solve for b zero and you solve for b one. Well, b one is just going to be uh, a one prime a zero, uh, a one prime a zero, and b b zero is just going to be. Uh, so it's going to be. Uh, so you have these two and those two, so it's going to be. Uh, Uh, a1, a0 inverted. Uh, yeah, so you can do you can do, yeah, you can do this basically. Um, so so that's a that's a solution uh, because the only time b0 is going to be zero is when uh, a1 and uh, a1 end with a a0 prime is is zero. Uh, or one rather, and uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So if you see, let me. I guess let me let me plug this in. I think I have this. Oh, I don't. Okay, hang on. Where am I? Okay. If we switch this out, then and we um, we'll just work it here real quick so you can be convinced okay yeah okay so here's our original um, predicament and so if you look at this the easiest way to so for a1 so you can see uh, let me just pop this down real quick so you can see for uh, for B1, B1 is just uh, it's only it's only one here. So that's a prime a1 prime a0. Okay, so that's that. Now what about uh, B0? Well, uh, let's look at that. So the so if we look at this, then we know when a1 is prime, then we have a one. So that's going to be a1 prime plus when we have both a1 and a0 so a1 a0 and that equals uh, b0 but a simpler way to do this is to take this line and just invert it which would be a1 a0 prime inverted and actually if you look at it, uh, it if you bring this in what you get is a1 prime plus um, um, yeah a1 prime plus uh, a0 um, plus a0 yep Um, uh, plus a zero, yeah, a one prime. So that would be 
these two plus well should give us this why does that not work um, oh a zero right it, it's, so and yeah and so then that's the same as a one prime plus a a one a zero plus a one prime a zero uh, but this one goes away so then you wind up with that all right so anyway uh, so that's how that works okay let me switch this back all right so you can see uh, so so that that's one way that we can um, Okay, so here's the circuit. So this is this is what gets synthesized. So you have uh, two bits of A coming in. You invert one of them, and so you're going to generate you're going to generate this term uh, for uh, B1 here with this uh, NAND gate. Well, they just they switch it to NAND form, and here uh, uh, NOR form rather. And here they switch it to NAND. So NOR gate, NAND gate. Yeah, really interesting. And that generates your output. So you can see that that's fairly optimized. OK, so uh, let's look at another one. This, this is back to the unintentional latch thing. Now, a number of you have already run into this problem as an actual problem uh, in your laboratories and what you found out let's see I'm do paint here no sorry uh, what you found out that when you create an unintentional latch it really screws your code up you don't want to do that so the way you avoid it is you have a default case you always uh, provide for all the options so in this case, uh, if I get rid of me, so you have uh, you have two input, you have an input A and an output B. A is a two-bit vector, B is a single vector bit. You make it a register, and then you have an always block with a case statement. You have cases zero, one, and two, but of course A is two bits, and it could be three is a possibility. So you have an assigned three. So if you don't include if you don't include uh, the default case then you can get an unintentional latch. So uh, we've talked about the, 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 gate, the gated D latch where you have a gate G. So this doesn't really have a clock. What it does is when the gates open, D, if D changes, then Q will follow. If the gate is closed, uh, then uh, whatever the last value for D was, uh, Q will hold that value. And uh, D can change, but it won't change the output Q as long as the gate is closed. So we talk about the gate being active. In this case, it's active high. So here, when G is 1, uh, the output's going to follow D, or Q is going to follow D. So if, so if you have the present state of Q, and then D goes to a 0, it's going to take it down. If Q is 1, it's going to go to 0. And then, so basically, Q, the next data Q follows D. Now, there's, this is a little confusing because there's actually no clock. So what this just means after the, when D changes, then Q plus is going to change. And uh, so if the gate signal, uh, again, is high, then Q plus equals D. All right. Whereas if the gate is low, then Q plus equals Q. All right. So what, what, what happens here if you get an unintentional latch? Well, so if you have uh, A1 and A0, uh, they're going to select this 4 to 1 MUX. And so what we're selecting for here uh, is the gates. If, if A1 and A0 are both true, 
uh, then if, if this generates a 1, it'll, then the gate will be closed. So a1 is true, a0 is true, the inverse will be uh, false, and then you'll get, a, you'll get a, you, the gate will be closed. But for any other value, for a1, 0, or for a0, 0, or if they're both 0, the gate is going to be open because of this uh, inversion here. So uh, this then is the latch. This this basically, and what this does, this this works when the th condition three is operative. So since since here, without the default, where we didn't specify the default originally, we just had zero, one, and two. Then then there's no condition for three. So that's where the that's where the unintentional latch. Oh, I see. I'm screwed up. Okay, so here's so here is this here is this gate data this this uh, gated D latch. When uh, when you didn't specify the result for three, then you generated this flip flop, if you will, or basically a gated D latch is what happened what you get what makes it gets made here and what this does is this allows the output d the, the output from this mux to to pass through as long as you're not in case three but if you're in case three then the gate is closed and the previous output of, of, of for this latch is preserved and that's what's output and not whatever the current thing is because there's nothing specified for three so it has to have this latch to remember what three was let me state that again because this is this is this is really it's fairly important. This is a this is something that comes up all the time. So when you when you do not specify one of the conditions, in this case, we didn't specify three. So here we are. Where is that uh, stupid code? Yeah, I. It's I guess it's really I think this slides out of order. So, so I guess this is the code. Was it, oh, okay, here's the code. So here's your code. Now they, okay, the default state didn't, uh, didn't specify anything. So in the default case, it didn't give an output for B. That's the mistake here. Yeah, so you do have a default case. You don't specify three, but you have a default case. But in default case, you just, it's an empty case. There's nothing there. So, so what, what the synthesizer knows is if A is a three, then you have to have a latch that remembers the previous value for B and outputs that. So we have case zero, case one, case two, but we don't have a case three specified. So that's what this looks like. And, uh, and you'll get this transparent latch added to your code. And here it is. All right, so you have uh, you have the three cases here, 0, 1, and 2, but for 3 you don't specify anything, and for that then you, you close the gate and you hold the previous value for B. So when you get this, you can see how it's going to mess up the output you're expecting. All right, so, uh, so basically then on top of that, your synthesizers uh, going to look at this, and it's going to uh, it's going to actually implement this uh, for uh, for for your output. So what you're going to get then is your B is going to follow uh, is basically going to be a zero prime uh, or a zero inverted. So B will be one when a zero is zero. It'll be 0 when a0 is 1, and it'll be 1 when a0 is 0. So it's just the inverse of a0. And a1 doesn't really affect b, uh, except in the case where a1 and a0 are both 1. And in that case, then you get the previous output for b. So this is what you get for your final synthesized circuit. Don't even have the multiplexer. So it's amazing these the the uh, optimization that can occur. So if you want to modify your code, now you can have a case 3 
So now you've covered all possible values of a, and uh, you specify that b is zero in the case of case three. And in this case then, uh, turns out then, now that you have this table, you can see that the output of b does not depend on a1, so it's just the inverse of a, zero. So that's your optimized code. b1 equals a0 prime. All right, here's another one. Um, if you have a module ab, well, with inputs uh, a, b, c, d, and e, and an output z. So a, b, c, d, and e, and output z. a and b are single bits. c, d, and e are three-bit vectors. And z is, is a three-bit output. Okay, so let's just look at this for a second. So what's going to be synthesized here? So if we look at this, um, so we have an always, an always block with two level signals. So we're thinking we're probably going to wind up with combinational logic here. Now we're, we, we, we have an if statement, an else if, and an else. Now let me just say this. Uh, one of the mistakes I made uh, when I did the practicum was I, I had an if statement here, and then I had another if statement here, and then I had an else. And what happened was, much to my chagrin, if this, it didn't matter what this one tested. If this were true, then it did some stuff. But because this wasn't an else if, this was an if, it also tested this one. And if this one was false, it automatically did the else. And the else set me to a different case. It left me in case one, and, and this moved me to case two, and I could never get to case two, no matter what I did. And I couldn't figure it out. And the reason, of course, is I should have had if, else, if, else, instead of if, if, else. Uh, so uh, it was a good lesson to just be really picky about making sure you have the, uh, the if statements lined up the way you need, need them. Now, maybe you do want if, if, else. That's fine. Uh, but, but the else then belongs to the second if statement and not to the first one. So you have to, you have to keep this in mind. And it can be, it can be hard to keep track of, 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 of the scope of your if statements. All right, so what's going to happen here? Okay, so we have these, we have these three vectors, uh, these three three-bit vectors that are going to output, z, one of them is going to output to z. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to test a. Now, if a is one, are we going to test b? The answer is no, we're not going to test b. If a is one, the output z is going to be c, and that's the end of it. So, uh, if, so only if a is zero do we have to worry about it. And if a is zero, then if b is zero, we get d, otherwise we get e. So now we have to make a little truth table, and here it is. So for zero, zero, we get d, for zero, one, we get e, and then if a is one, regardless of the value of b, we're getting c. So, boom, here's what we get. We get this, uh, we get this multiplexer. Now, we actually get three of them because these are three-bit lines. So we have three four-to-one muxes. They all get the same control lines. And the, the, each one of them gets three bits of D, three bits of E, three bits of C. Uh, so the first multiplexer gets D0, E0, and C0. And the next one gets D1, E1, C1, and finally D2, E2, C2. And the output follows. So this is how, this is how it would be generated. Okay, let's look at another one. Okay, so in this one, we're, we, uh, we want to generate this less than or equal. And so what we have to do is we have to have a four bit comparator with four bits of A and four bits of B. And then we have these three outputs, equal, less than, or greater than. And then we just or equal and less than together and we get less than or equal. All right. now. The uh, so if we uh, look at this in code, so we have a clock a and b a greater than or equal, uh, and uh, an accumulator and a count. So when the synthesis look when the synthesizer looks at this, it it looks at this assign greater than or equal a greater than 
uh, are equal to b, and of course a and b are four-bit vectors. Uh, this this is a four-bit comparator. So so the har so the library so the synthesizer is going to look in the library and it's going to find a four-bit comparator and grab it. And then you have this always block here where you're going to increment the uh, the temporary accumulator with the current accumulator plus b. So you're going to add four bits to the uh, four-bit accumulator right here, and uh, and then you're going to this count temp is going to be count plus one, and uh, so this is it. So each clock tick, it's going to increment count by one. And then uh, this count temp will then instantly be transferred back to count. So, so this will basically update count. But this only happens on the clock. And this generates, uh, this adds B to the accumulator and stores it in the temporary accumulator. And here the accumulator then is updated with the temporary accumulator. Now part of this is because uh, these are going to be wires and on the left side you have to have registers so that's why we use these temp registers. So the synthesizer is going to go out and grab a 4-bit comparator for this. It's going to grab a 4-bit register and a 4-bit adder for this and a 4-bit counter for that. So that's basically how the synthesizer assigns these these hardware, these library, uh, uh, this functionality that's stored in the library as it, as it looks at this code. Okay, um, so and here basically is what it looks like. So the four-bit adder and has four-bit adder and four-bit register. So we need this to implement that part. The four-bit counter is here, and then here's the comparator, which in this case generates the greater than or equal. All right, so let's look at this. So generate optimized hardware for this statement. Uh, a is a four-bit vector. And we want to we want to see if a equals three. This is a logical equal, so eq three will be one if it's true and zero if it's not true. All right, so how are we going to do that? So a equals three. Well, so we can do it like this. A is a four-bit vector. We're we're assuming this. Uh, so that means that for a to be equal to three. We, the only combination that will work is 0, 0, 1, 1. So uh, if A3 is 0, we'll invert it. That'll be a 1. If A2 is 0, that'll, we'll invert that. That'll be a 1. And then if these two are both 1, we'll have four 1s, and EQ3 will be true. All right. So uh, when we... so. So you can see those are just some examples of how the synthesizer uh, approaches some of these things. Uh, let me put myself back here. So it, that, those are just kind of examples. Now, uh, so what what are some what are some of the uh, what are some of the um, so as, as the synthesis tool uh, as a function? There are trade-offs, right? So we're we're, we're always trading off. Uh, the minimum amount of circuitry that we're using, uh, we're also trading off speed and power consumption. Uh, so the, the energy and the time delay are inversely related. So more speed takes more energy. Um, and uh, that's particularly true when we're making integrated circuits. Now if we're using an FPGA, uh, a lot of those choices have already been made for us. Uh, and so we're just we're fitting our design into the existing hardware. So what are some so what are some metrics when we make an integrated circuit? So there are a couple. One of them is an area time product, or area time squared. And another one is energy delay or product energy delay. So temperature obviously fits in. Uh, to this speed because you you are constrained by temperature 
you have to get rid of the heat and if you don't uh, your chip will get too hot and it'll destroy itself or certainly reduce its uh, longevity dramatically so uh, so here's some of the major CAD tool vendors now Cadence, Synopsys, Mentor Graphic, Magma, these guys these guys uh, they're they're basically uh, for building integrated circuits application specific integrated circuits the FPGA CAD tools are usually manufacturer dependent so obviously Xilinx uh, wants you to use their integrated uh, wants you to use their FPGAs so they're going to give you for the most part they're going to give you their tools uh, they don't give them all away and they and they charge for some of them uh, but they, they give a lot of it away because it, of course it if they sell these chips that's that's partly how they make their money although they also make some of their money on their CAD tools so it's kind of a tr bit of a trade-off same for Altera and so for Actel. So if you're going to use Xilinx chips, you have to use their CAD tool. If you're going to use Altera, you have to use their CAD tool. If you're going to use Actel, you have to use their CAD tool. Whereas if you're going to make a chip, now you've got some choices because obviously there are there are uh, different options out there. All right, so. We talked a little bit about uh, mapping. Let's see, I didn't really mean to do that. Mapping, placement, and routing. So um, you can implement your, so especially for an FPGA, but this is true for an application specific integrated circuit too. There's usually a million different ways you can implement this. And so uh, in our case, since we have lookup tables and muxes, that's generally how it's going to be implemented on, on our FPGA. But if you're using a different one, you may have a lot of NAND gates or NOR gates or other combinations. Um, so if we're using an FPGA with lookup tables, then we're going to have to map it to that type of hardware. If, um, if, if we target a design that, that has, say only has two NAND gates, uh, then we have to map it into a form uh, that uses only two input NAND gates. So uh, so your target drives uh, drives the mapping and placement and routing. And in our case, we're we're mapping into lookup tables and multiplexers. Placement, on the other hand, has to do and so so in the mapping step, we take we take essentially the net list that the synthesizer comes up with using the library uh, the library functionalities and and then that net list then has to be mapped into the actual components and that's what mapping does placement ha has to do with picking the actual slices and IO blocks that are going to be used on the chip so the mapping deals with the, pr the prototypic slices how many slices you need but the placement determines actually which slices get used and this has an issue because once you get all this placed then that drives the how the routing has to be done now the problem with routing is that it, it when you have critical timing uh, the 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 length of the wires as the, as they go through these big interconnect matrices can be dramatically different uh, depending on how how they're how they're routed and of course then the, the routing is driven by the placement so so the placement's important to try and to try and take advantage of better path link and and to uh to try and get your wire links minimized as much as possible which that's gonna that's gonna drive that's gonna drive your your timing whether you're gonna get timing closure or whether you're not gonna achieve the timing you wanted and why is that important? Well, that turns out to be important because that, that then is going to determine how fast your device is. And if you have a competitor that's got a little faster device out there, then it could put you at a competitive disadvantage. So, you, you, so pretty much most products are very sensitive to the speed that they can run at. Routing, again, once, you, once you've placed it, now you have to connect things. And, and how you connect them this has to be done through this big interconnect matrices so it's greatly to place that dependent on the placement and usually what they do is place and route place and route in sort of multiple steps uh, until they 
until they begin to close in on a, on a reasonable, reasonably optimized solution. And then once you've got sort of the, the global routing choices made, then the detailed routing can be done. Now sometimes your, your uh, integrated development environment can let you do what's called incremental routing, where if you only change a little bit of the circuit, then it may leave everything else in place and only, and only modify a small part of the circuit that you changed. So here's, here's a routed FPGA. So these are the, these are the functional blocks and here, here are how the, the interconnects have been routed around. And you can see this definitely, um, you, you can imagine that some of these are quite long paths. You can see this one starts over here, goes all the way here, all the way there, and, and well, down to there. Down to there, and then runs back up in here somewhere. So some of these can be quite long, and, and that can definitely start to affect timing. All right, so that pretty well completes uh, the first, uh, the, uh, let's see, I guess that's the second part. All right, so let me let me just stop with that. I'm going to, I think I'm going to, uh, let's, and then, so I, I wanted, um, sorry, why am I having, fighting this? Okay. So I so I think I've given uh, as far as we went over the schedule. So I will do I will do some review. Uh, I'll do review tomorrow, or I mean Wednesday, and uh, so I'll, I'll tell you exactly what's going to be on the test. There are some there is some stuff on Blackboard. It's not I don't think I think the test should be pretty straightforward. If you've looked at all the videos, done the quizzes, done your homework, you should be fine. Um, I'm not. I'm not going to give you a bunch of pimp questions, and I'm not going to have you write a bunch of code. That's that's why we're doing the practicum. It's basically to take the the coding part off of the test. Uh, so that's the idea. Okay. Um, so if you have questions, uh, come uh, come to the uh, twelve o'clock uh, office hours Zoom, and uh, we'll see. I might even offer a Zoom later in the week to. Uh, just to, if you have questions about the, the, the test. The test will be on Friday. The practicum is due Wednesday. Okay? And uh, I can't remember. Let me look at the syllabus real quick since we're here. Um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, I'll do this. I'll shrink this down a little bit. Yeah. So... Um, Yeah, so there is a there is a homework due uh, today, and I and like I said, I will also put in the midterm grades. Um, okay, with that, we'll quit.